Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Lord, we praise you, Lord. Yes, you Lord. As we celebrate your resurrection this week, Lord, of how great you are. As we sing praise and worship, Lord, I pray that we would remember how great you are, Lord. Every single thing that you've done in our life, Lord. And when we hold on to those things, when we go through trials, Lord, I pray that uh, we would worship with all our might and all our strength, Lord. Until we're with you and we can worship you at your feet, Lord. Bless this study this evening, Lord. Bless Pastor J.D. Continue, Lord, to give him strength and protection for him and his family, Lord, that he might do your work this day, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And amen. Wow. Row rowdy bunch tonight. Welcome. You can be seated. So glad you're here. So glad those of you joining us online are. A couple things before we get started. Uh, Tuesday night, uh, upcoming, April 2nd, 7 p.m. is going to be our prayer meeting. And I uh, would really encourage you to attend because there have been, as you might imagine, many questions about Sunday's prophecy update. And I'm going to explain what happened with the manifestation of a demonic spirit, and also why we did what we did. Then I want to get into the Word, <laughs> uh, go right to Scripture, and we'll look at this very real reality. Is that a redundant redundancy? <laughs> We're going to look at the reality of the demonic realm, and especially the pronounced increase and unprecedented presence in these last days of demonic manifestations like this. So uh, make plans to come on Tuesday, and um, we'll take and tackle this tough topic. Did I get enough T's in there? All right. So I know that many of you think that I forgot that this Sunday is Resurrection Sunday, as evidenced by the conspicuous absence of any mention of any special service times or anything like that. I want you to know I did not forget, nor would I ever forget, Resurrection Sunday. And I call it that, and not by its pagan name, for reasons that I don't want to yell at you about tonight. <laughs> so suffice it to say, I know this Sunday is Resurrection Sunday, and we are going to have our regular services at the regular times, first and second service. We'll start with the prophecy update, and we're going to look at how that, all that's happening in the world today, now, keyword now, all points to the person of Jesus Christ, including this red heifer in this stock photo uh, pictured here. And we're going to talk about the prophetic significance of the red heifer. And I know many of you know about the red heifer and its importance. We're going to go into, this is all, all you're going to get out of me. You're going to have to come on Sunday. So this is all you're going to get, maybe a little bit more. But we're going to go into Numbers chapter 19, one of the most fascinating chapters when it comes to typology and prophecy pointing to the person of Jesus Christ and the finished work on the cross and the resurrection. It is just astonishing. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, that'll be first service, then second service at its regular time will be the Resurrection Sunday sermon. Get this. 
Uh, we started in the book of Revelation, right? And as it turns out, <laughs> as only God can, He timed the passage in Revelation verses 4 through 8, because we started with just the first three verses, verses 1 through 3. We're going to pick it up in verse 4. We're going to get to verse 8. And wouldn't you know it, it's about the resurrection. So that's our text. And that's my story. And I'm sticking with it. So I'm titling the sermon, What Christ's Resurrection Means to Me. And again, our text will be Revelation chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. So that'll be second service as we celebrate Resurrection Sunday, and how and what the resurrection of Jesus Christ not only means to us, but for us. So looking forward to that as well. And tonight we continue in and with our verse by verse study through Daniel. So Lord willing, we're going to make it through the end of chapter 1 tonight. We can do this. Last week we started in Daniel, and we got to verse 8. So we're going to pick it up tonight in verse 9. And what we're about to see, as we come to the end of just the first chapter, is how that when we honor God, God will in turn honor us. And when He does, it is always, without exception, exceedingly abundantly above and beyond anything we could have ever imagined, let alone asked why, because that's who God is and how God is. I've asked this question before. It's rhetorical in a way, but you know how it is that it's hard to give someone a gift that has everything. We say it like this, what do, you, what do you give someone who has everything? Have you ever thought of it like this? What, what can I give God? I mean, He has everything. He knows everything. You know, He's all, all powerful, all knowing, all present. What do you give God that He doesn't already have? Obedience. When we obey Him and honor Him, that is the one thing that He does not necessarily have. And this is what we're going to see tonight with Daniel. And we're going to talk about this as we get into this book. But for right now, we still have their Hebrew names. Now last week in the first eight verses, we uh, have recorded their Persian names, or Babylonian names, pardon me, their Chaldean names that were given to them uh, to replace their Jewish names. Now, why is that important? Because in that culture, the parents would wait to name the children to see what their, you know, personality and temperament and nature was. And then they would also name them according to how they wanted them to be raised in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. So we got into the, the meaning of the names, their Hebrew names. And it's going to kind of take a turn as we get into the book, because tonight in chapter 1, we still are seeing them referred to by their Hebrew names. But then at some point it's going to shift, and they're going to be referred to as, and by their Chaldean names. So I bring that up because these four men, and oh, by the way, for Daniel at the very least, he's probably, as we talked about last week, between the ages of 14 and 17. Some believe he's about 15 years old right now. And that's important, and that's going to be key and germane to our understanding of this book and this man, <laughs> because he will be in Babylon for the rest of his life. He will never see Jerusalem again. Even when the captivity is over and the captives return, he does not. 
he stays there. And it's believed that he's going to be in his 90s, and God is going to continue to use him throughout the entirety of his life. He starts off as a very young man. He's a teenager. He doesn't even have his driver's license yet. Try to wrap your mind around that and see what God is going to do with this man and his three friends, all because they honored him. God, can I say it like this? God can't resist when one of His children honors Him and obeys Him, because He in turn will honor and bless abundantly, exceedingly. We're blessed by God for honoring and our obeying of God. And that's what we're going to see. So let's pray, and then we'll jump in, if you would join with me. Father, thank you. Lord, we're so looking forward to what you have for us tonight here in Daniel. And as we're getting to know him and these three Hebrew men, young men, we're seeing your hand on their lives, your blessing on their lives, and how it is that you're exalting them and using them in a mighty way, all because they honor you, they glorify you, they bless you, and they obey you. And so Lord, tonight we want to not just read about it or hear about it, but we want to apply it, take heed to it in our own lives, because we want to be like Daniel in our honoring of You and obedience to You. So Lord, would You remove all the craziness of everything in our lives? I mean, just this last week, I know for many, just crazy stuff, off the charts crazy stuff, demonic stuff, because we know how close we are. So Lord, we, the enemy wants to distract us with those things, but we need for You to help us concentrate and focus so that we're not distract, distracted. We don't want to miss anything that you have for us tonight, Lord. So speak, as you're always so faithful to, in and through your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right, verse 9. Now, God, I mean right out of the shoot here, God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. We're off to a good start. And the chief of the eunuchs, verse 10, said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who has appointed your food and drink. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? So again, these are young men, teenagers. Then you would endanger my head before the king. Oh, everybody's looking out for himself. I mean, it started off pretty good. At first it's like, wow, you really care. No, I'm just covering my, my own basis here, because I am responsible for you, and I don't want to present you to King Nebuchadnezzar and having you looking all shabby and thin and scrawny and unhealthy. And so I need you to eat, and I need your faces to not look worse. Right there, I, this, I don't like verse 10. I'm just saying personally, uh, why should he see your faces looking worse? My face is looking worse every day. So <laughs> this would be a problem, but not looking worse than the other young men. Who are we speaking about here? We're speaking about the Chaldean young men that are there in Babylon, along with these Hebrew young men. And my head's on the line. If you guys don't look good when I present you to him, and we'll see this presentation to King Nebuchadnezzar tonight in this chapter, then it's my head. <laughs> 
So eat up and you've got to eat all of this. So verse 11, now watch what Daniel says. Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, here's their Hebrew names, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And I want you to pay particular attention to verse 12. We can learn from this. This is Daniel, a 15 year old, talking to this ruler over him. Please stop right there. How polite is this? How considerate and courteous and respectful is this for this young man to speak in such a way? Please. That word is hardly used in our day. I mean, I, for you young people here tonight or watching online, we love you, but we need to talk about this, because you guys don't respect your elders. You, you don't, you, you in fact disrespect people who are older than you that deserve your respect. You be respectful. I'm not done yet. <laughs> They're so disrespectful, these, this generation. Bah, I tell you when I was your age, you know how that goes. Now, I'm, I'm emphasizing this, maybe overemphasizing this for a reason, because this eunuch over Daniel and his three friends had the power to put them to death. So Daniel knows what he's up against, and he's being very wise, very prudent, very discerning, very respectful, because he's got a serious problem now. What's the problem? Well, he's just got done being told that he has to eat meat sacrificed to idols. And he can't do that. And all of the, the food and the meat and the drink, it's all been sacrificed to idols. And that would be a violation of his conscience before the Lord his God. So now how is he going to get out of it? Is he going to protest, go on a hunger strike? Is he going to start picketing? Is he going to start posting on social media? Can you believe it? And just all of this. No. He's going to reason wisely and respectfully with this man. And he says to him, please, now watch this, test your servants for 10 days. I'm listening. And let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Okay, go on. Then, verse 13, let our appearance be examined before you, and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. And now watch this, as you see fit, so deal with your servants. In other words, sir, ma'am, that's another one. I shouldn't have didn't gone there. I, when I hear a teenager say, yes, sir, or yes, ma'am, I'm like, where are you from? <laughs> what is your name? Who are you? Can I have you? <laughs> Can you talk to my kids? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. How respectful is that? Anyway, I digress. But back to Daniel. Here he is. How respectful, sir, please, sir, please, respectfully. Consider another option here, and, and just kind of put us to the test. We've got time, 10 days. Let us eat not that meat sacrificed to idols, or drink that drink sacrificed to idols. But instead, let us just eat these vegetables and drink only water, just for 10 days. And then at the end of the 10 days, 
you can assess us. And based on that assessment, as you see fit, whatever you do or whatever you say, we will concur and submit to it. Oh, wow. Well, that's, a, that's new. See, I totally wouldn't have responded like that. And don't look at me like that, because you wouldn't have responded like that either. You would have said something like this. I won't look at anybody. You would have said something like, I ain't eating that. I'll die first, in Jesus' name. Well, you've completely blown it already. So the book of J.D. ends with chapter 1, right there. <laughs> Verse 13, the end. Next book. No, Daniel, this is the wisdom from above. What's the wisdom from above? James explains it this way. It's first pure, peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, submit, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without a hypocrisy or partiality, bearing fruit unto righteousness. Translated, you know it's the wisdom from above that God gives you, contrasted with worldly wisdom, which, which James also identifies and explains. But that wisdom from above, and you know how it is when you ask for wisdom, God is going to show up and rush in and give you wisdom, and He will not withhold the wisdom that you need when you ask Him for the wisdom. You, you have not, because you ask not. I see Daniel here like Nehemiah. Remember when Nehemiah is going before the king as the cupbearer? And he is very discouraged. And you don't go before the king in his presence with a sad face, because it's, again, off with your head. So he is asked, hey, Nehemiah, dude, what's wrong? And he goes on. And the text, the, the detail in the text is such that Nehemiah is like one of those quick prayers, God, I need wisdom, what do I say? because my, my life is on the line here. What do I say? And God gave him the right words to say in the right way. And God was orchestrating everything. And this king would pay for everything that Nehemiah needed to rebuild the wall miraculously in 53 days. Is it 53 or 58? You don't know either. So it's either 53 or 58. Somebody look it up after. So this is Daniel, real quick, just in his heart. Lord, what do I, what do, I do here? Because he's going to make us eat this meat sacrifice to idols. And that's not OK. So God gave him the wisdom in that moment, that exact precise moment. Don't worry what you shall speak, for it will be given you that wisdom from above, what you shall speak in the hour that you need to speak it. Now here's the other thing. God's not going to give you tomorrow's manna today, meaning that He's not going to give you what you need until the time that you need it. See, I like to know ahead of time. Because like, no, just trust me, I got this, and I got you. You just look to me, and I will give you my wisdom from above on how you should deal with this dilemma. And this is a dilemma in every sense of the word. I mean, you could liken it to a situation where you're in an occupation, and your employer is forcing you to do something that you know is going to require that you disobey God. So what do you do? I quit. Well, you can't. You're a slave. You're captive in Babylon, so you can't resign. You know, I tender my resignation. <laughs> That's good. That's funny. You, you funny guy, you, Daniel. No, you can't. So what are you going to do? So this is God's wisdom, God's way. And listen, He's honoring God 
And God in turn is honoring him with the wisdom from above to present this alternative to this ruler who had this power over him. Now, I mentioned last week, and I want to make sure to carefully communicate something that's here. And sadly, some have taught that's not here. And what I'm speaking of is the vegetarianism that has come from this specific passage of Scripture. I, I, I know of one, I'm probably uh, not uh, referencing it correctly, but the Daniel diet. I mean, books have been written and sold for $39.99 based on this passage, the Daniel diet. Listen, as we're going to see in a moment, they are going to look great. But it wasn't because they were vegetarians for 10 days. Now, I'm going to probably get in trouble, but whatever. Um, you need protein, man. And the meat is there to eat. Eat meat. Ask Peter. No, it's unclean. No. Don't call unclean what God's called clean. Barbecue the thing. <laughs> Why did I? You understand that Thursday nights are all extemporaneous. I don't use notes. Maybe I should for that reason. But let me, let me use uh, an example with Samson. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. So watch this. You're going to write a book about strength by growing your hair long. Okay. Is this working? So what's the source of your strength, Samson? Oh, it's the length of your hair. So we'll cut your hair and your strength is gone. So what do we write a book about now? Don't cut your hair, man, and you'll be strong. But if you cut your hair, so the strength comes by way of the length of your hair. The, the physical appearance and healthiness comes by way of having a vegetarian Daniel diet. No! This is a spiritual, supernatural dynamic, if I can say it like that. It's not Samson's hair. It was the sign that Samson's hair represented and it wasn't Daniel and his friend's diet as a vegetarian diet. In fact, I know I'm really going to get in trouble on this one. But actually, there are some very unhealthy vegetarians. Now, if you're a vegetarian, God bless you. We love you. I won't look at you. You know who you are. But you've got to know that there are certain things that you need that are not in vegetables. And you can try all the quinoa you want, and all the alternatives you want. But you need meat. You need protein. By the way, Jesus wasn't a vegetarian. Might as well. He ate meat. He particularly liked seafood. See, I have a seafood diet. I see food and I eat it. Oh, you heard that one? That's not an original, obviously. That's why it's so funny. Okay, this is going to come up again, so just bear with me. So he consented. I mean, Daniel, if you think about it, has given him every reason to consent and no reason not to consent. How do you say no to that? That's a good deal. That makes sense. That's a great idea, actually. I mean, I got nothing to lose. You're basically saying, we got 10 days. You're just going to eat whatever you're going to eat. 
I'm not going to eat that, but you can eat it. And for 10 days, what's happening here? He's honoring God, and God is in turn honoring and blessing him for honoring him. It's not the food he's eating, it's the honoring and the obeying. The, you got it? Now, he consented with them in this matter and tested them 10 days. Now, at the end of the 10 days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacy. What? No, I thought that when you eat salads only, you lose weight. But that's not what happened. They only ate vegetables, and now they're fatter, looking healthier. They don't look sickly. Again, it's not vegetarian versus non-vegetarian. No, God is honoring them for honoring Him and making them in their appearance be superior to those other young men who ate that meat sacrificed to idols and that drink and all of the king's delicacies. And verse 16, you'll forgive me for seeing the humor in verse 16, because you got to think about these other guys. Thus the steward took away their portion of delicacies in the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. <laughs> Thanks a lot, guys. Man, no more barbecues, no more prime rib, no more meat. Thanks a lot. Now we got to eat vegetables and drink water. No more glass of wine. Boy, that's a glass of wine with, don't they pair it? I'm not a Som sommelier, or so, is that what they call them? You know, all these expert wine tasters that they, they, can, they can tell you the wine blindfolded even before the bottles open. Yeah, that's a, uh, what do they call it, a Cabernet? Or a, obviously, I don't know my, my wine. <laughs> but they would pair the wine with, the, you know, certain wines, I guess, go with. I didn't need to take it that far. I don't know why I did. But anyway, no more wine and no more meat for you. Now, verse 17, as for these four young men, here it is, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Oh, they're not synonymous in terms? No, we're going to see that, Lord willing, uh, next week, or the week after, depending on how far we get. What's a vision? That's when you're awake and you're given a vision. This is what revelation is. John was awake when he received the vision, the revelation of Jesus Christ on the island of Patmos. What's a dream? That's when you're sleeping and God gives you a dream, very different than a vision. So delineate between those two. And that's going to be important to our understanding as we get further into the book. Now, did you notice this? God gave them knowledge and skill and wisdom and understanding. God gave them that. In all literature and wisdom, because remember from, from last week that they were going to indoctrinate them for three years in the ways of the Chaldeans. So God is protecting them and honoring them for honoring Him. And He's going to be the one to give them the knowledge and the skill. And they will be, particularly Daniel, so highly favored because of this God-given knowledge, supernatural wisdom, supernatural. Again, in chapter 2, when Daniel is brought before King Nebuchadnezzar, after he's threatened 
to be put to death, as with all of the prophets who could not. And Nebuchadnezzar, smart guy, that guy. He's like, interpret my dream. And all of the, you know, prophets and in, interpreting the vision and the dreams are like, well, tell us what your dream was and we'll interpret it. And Nebuchadnezzar is like, nice try. How about you tell me the dream and then you interpret it and then I'll know. Because you can make up anything you want. And so when they couldn't, Nebuchadnezzar issues the order to have every single one of them put to death, including Daniel. Except that God gave Daniel the understanding in interpreting visions and dreams. You remember Joseph? There he sits in a pit, in a dungeon. And as God would have it, like with Nebuchadnezzar, God gives Pharaoh a dream. And he can't sleep, and he's so disturbed by it. He, it's so real, and it's so terrifying, and he wants to know what it means. So all their prophets and seers and magicians and everybody's coming to Pharaoh, and he's like, what does this mean? And they don't know what it means, because God did not give them the understanding or the interpretation of it. But he gave it to a guy by the name of Joseph. Well, get him. Where is he? Well, you know, actually, <laughs> um, when, when I was in prison, incarcerated with him, I had a dream, and he interpreted it. And it came to pass exactly as he said it would, and that I would be restored as your cupbearer. And then he asked me to remember him, and I totally forgot him, until you reminded me of him, or better said, God reminded me of him. It's like, oh yeah. He also interpreted the baker's dream. Didn't end so well for that guy, because he, it was fulfilled exactly as Joseph interpreted it. But he died. So, and that's what Joseph said would happen. So fast forward now, here's Daniel. And Nebuchadnezzar is given this dream, but he already gave Daniel the understanding to interpret the dream that he's about to give Nebuchadnezzar to interpret. So verse 18, now at the end of the days, when the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Whew. Hope this goes well. This is the interview. This is it. Then verse 19, the king interviewed them. And listen to this, among them all, None was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they served before the king. Now stop right there before we end with verses 20 and 21. God will uniquely position you for such a time as this, because He wants to give you favor in the eyes of someone that He wants to use you in their lives. And that's what He's doing here, and that's what He does with us here. He will choreograph the steps of our lives. We talked about this last week. Daniel could have never imagined that his life would end up this way. But God had a plan for him. God positioned him uniquely there in Babylon, where he was needed the most, where God could mightily use him in ways that he could not have otherwise used him had he remained in Jerusalem. See, we don't know that, but God knows that. So here we are, we're, we're kind of stuck in this spiritual rut. And God wants to move us and use us but he can't because we're too comfortable where we're at. 
So what's he going to do? Well, it's been said that God comforts the afflicted, but so too does God afflict the comfortable. So here's, here's the, the, the problem that God has. Not that God has problems. We're, we're the problem. The problem is God wants to get us from point A to point B. But we're, we're, we're too cozy and comfortable in point A. We're not even considering point B. Well, now God's got a plan, and point B is part of that plan, and God wants to use me in ways that I could have never imagined, and put me in situations, by the way, that are by any stretch of the imagination impossible, so that He can do the impossible. So now how's He going to get you there? Well, He's got to mess up point A. All of a sudden things start not going so well. And you start thinking about, well, maybe I need to start looking at some options here. Ah, uh -huh. it's working. God's disrupting, disturbing point A, where you're stuck. Because He's got this magnificent plan for you in point B, and He's going to move you to point B, but you've got to be willing to let go of point A. Now, this is faith, because faith is the antithesis of sight. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence, strong word, of that which is yet unseen. In other words, faith says, I already know it's going to happen, so by faith I'm going to step out in faith, knowing that God is going to bring it to fruition and bless it and honor it. That's faith. I don't see it, but I believe it. Now this is where Jesus said, believing is seeing, which goes against everything within our sin and human and Adamic nature. Because see, to us it's seeing is believing. No, believe and you will see. This is Abraham. When he left Ur of the Chaldees, not knowing where he was going, faith. You trust me. I don't want to go to Babylon. I'm very comfortable here in Jerusalem. I got a nice apartment. The rent's not that expensive. And I'm, I'm very happy here. Well, I need, I need you to go to Tel Abib. Well, is Tel Aviv close enough? No, Tel Abib in Babylon. Okay, why? Well, you'll see. I'm only 15. I don't even have my driver's license. How am I going to get there? And I'll get you there. <laughs> and there he finds himself in this foreign land. And oh, by the way, he is far away from home. Who's going to know? I think about Joseph in Egypt. Here's Potiphar's wife. He's a long ways from home. He's all alone. Nobody's going to know. You know that um, question, very good question, one that we should all allow the Holy Spirit to search our hearts concerning. Who are you when nobody's looking? Who are you when nobody's looking? Now here's Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah, and they are in a strange land, far away from their homeland. And God has found favor and given them favor and honor in the sight of this King Nebuchadnezzar, who God Himself refers to as His servant. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar only does what God allows him to do. We're going to see that just come leaping off the pages of this amazing book. So back to Daniel. You imagine how tense and stressful that job interview must have been? I mean, they, they already knew by faith that they looked good, even better than everybody else. So they knew that part was going to be okay. But when it says the king interviewed them, 
In other words, he questioned them. You know, they, they, they have, I guess, I've never, I don't have a resume. I mean, it wouldn't, there wouldn't be anything on it. It would just be, anyway. But they have, you know, it's a science, right? The, you know, the way you have your resume and then job interview questions. Things, you know, 10 things to know about your job interview. Have you read those questions? I'm looking at these questions going, uh-oh, <laughs> I, I hope I'm never asked that, because I'm just thinking, I'm going to give the wrong answer. I, they're going to interview me and question me and ask me specific questions. And every single question that they were asked, they answered in such a way that they were among them all standing out like none of the others, and they were found to be superior. Why? Because God gave them that wisdom. And we're going to read that next in verse 20. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, interviewed them, questioned them, queried them, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in his realm. Thus, verse 21, Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. Do you realize in a span of 70 plus years, he is going to see kings come and go. He's got Cyrus, Darius, Nebuchadnezzar, and he's going to, you know, as he gets older, he's going to know these heirs to the throne of Babylon, these successors, these succeeding kings, and he's going to be able to say to them, I remember you when you were in diapers, king. <laughs> I mean, that's let me try this. The only commandment in the Ten Commandments that promises a blessing is the Fifth Commandment. What's the Fifth Commandment? Honor thy father and thy mother, so that the days upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee may be long. My parents made me, forced me to memorize that in the King James Version. I remember it to this day. Um, all the other commandments, thou shalt not, you're going to die. Thou shalt not, you're going to die. Thou shalt not, you're going to die. In the day that you do, you will die. Commandment number five, honor thy father and thy mother, so that the days upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee may be long. Did you know that number five is the number of grace? And the fifth commandment is the only commandment that has any grace? God's grace, I will bless you with a long, rich, fulfilling life, and a, a blessed life, if you will honor me. Because you see, the father and the mother are the God-given authorities in the life of that child. And when you honor, this is very important by the way, and please don't miss this, and this is not for young people, this is for adults too, when it comes to our fathers and mothers, if they're still living, you still honor them. And when you do, God will honor you. And here's why. Because when we honor them, it's like we're honoring God as our Heavenly Father. The way we honor our father and mother, and dare I say, our father and mother-in-law, Nah, nah, nah. Now nah, you're pushing it, Pastor. No. Nah. You honor your, they're still your father-in-law, not outlaw, <laughs> in-law, and you honor them. And this goes back to, and I won't belabor it, but it's the respect for authority. If children are not taught to respect authority at a young age, 
it's probably because their parents don't respect authority. Because it's not what's taught, it's what's caught. You think about these four young teenage men, they had godly parents. I mean, it, they had to have godly parents to give them such godly names to live up to and grow into. These were, you ever think about their parents? I mean, they're still 15. Their parents are probably still living. And they're probably still in Jerusalem. And they probably missed their sons who were in Babylon. But they honored their father and their mother, and they're honoring God. And God in turn is honoring them by blessing them, and not just blessing them, blessing them 10 times more. This is again who God is and how God is. God doesn't just like, okay, bless us proportionate to how we honor Him. He'll honor us. No, you, you honor me, I'm going to bless and honor you 10 times more than you could have ever imagined. Why? Because you honored me. And I'm going to bless you with a long, fulfilling life. And that is exactly what happened with Daniel. I can't even imagine what his life must have been like. I mean, if he's about 15, let's say here at this time, and he's going to live to be in his 90s, wow, he's seen a few things. He's been around the block, as they say. Man, I would just like to sit around the barbecue, because we eat meat with Daniel, and just talk story with this guy. Wow, what, what was that like when you went that first time? before King Nebuchadnezzar, and he examined you, and he's looking you over. Turn around. Okay, questions. Here we go. You ready? Question number one. Question number 38. <gasps> How nervous am I? But God gave him and them the wisdom and honored them. And when we get to chapter 2 next week, Lord willing, we're going to see these other magicians and astrologers who were in all his realm, that Daniel and his three friends were 10 times better than. They're going to be the first ones brought in. Curiously, Daniel and his three friends are not brought in when Nebuchadnezzar is given this dream that he needs interpreted. He demands to be interpreted. Why is that? Why weren't Daniel and his three friends invited to the party? Oh, because God is again orchestrating the circumstances and choreographing the steps perfectly according to His prophetic plan. Because when they seek out Daniel, and Daniel can, can you imagine when he hears the news, hey, we blew it, man. We blew it, bro. What happened? Well, King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, and we, we, we were ready to interpret it, but he demanded that we tell him the dream first, and then interpret it. And no, none of us can do that. I, the, for those of you that read ahead to stay ahead, you already know what's ahead. But spoiler alert, Daniel says, because he's, they're all going to get killed. And they actually went to Daniel to find him and to kill him, because that's what Nebuchadnezzar had ordered, because nobody can interpret his dream by telling him first what his dream was before they interpret it. And here's Daniel going, wait, don't kill me yet. Can I have just a little bit of time? And what does he do? He seeks the Lord. And what does the Lord do? He reveals to him the dream and the interpretation of the dream. And so what does Daniel do? I mean, could you imagine the relief for these guys that weren't killed yet? All these astrologers and magicians in his realm, they were in his area, you know, part of his, 
you know, a group before King Nebuchadnezzar. And <laughs> I wonder how they felt about their new comrades from Jerusalem. I mean, first of all, aren't these the same guys that we got our wine taken away and our meat taken away because of? Yeah, it's them. And He just told you to wait, because He might be able to tell Nebuchadnezzar what the dream was, and then interpret it. Yeah, same guy. And if He can, does that mean we're not going to die? Yeah. Okay, I like this guy again. Let's do, let's do this. And God does do this again as we'll see. Let me just end it this way. It's very simple, really. I know obedience to God and honoring of God may seem like, man, that's just hard. And it's painted that way, isn't it? The world is all too quick to paint a pure and holy and righteous and obedient God honoring life as being hard too many rules, too strict, no fun. And the opposite is true. So here's this picture that's painted of honoring God being hard. But you know what's harder than honoring God? Not honoring God. The path of the sinner is hard. <laughs> what's harder than obedience? Disobedience. What's harder than honoring God? Dishonoring God. Not bringing God honor and glory, not glorifying God, not giving God all the glory that is due His holy name by your life. Let me just leave you with this. Did I already say I was going to end? Okay, this will be the final closing then. My life, the purpose of my life, the purpose of your life, the purpose of my marriage, the purpose of your marriage, the purpose of your career. You can fill in the blanks. The purpose of our life is to bring glory and honor to God. And when we do, whoo! You can quote me on that. You have to say it just like that. Woo! <laughs> you can add whatever volume you want. Watch what God is going to do. It's like, did you see that? He just honored me. Get down there. Oh, we got another one. Oh, this is good. It's going to be good. He's honoring me. He's glorifying me. And I'm going to honor Him and bless Him. Capono, come on up. Stand up. We'll pray. Thank You, Lord. Once again, we end the Bible study with an example of a very godly young man. whom we can learn from. And that's why we have this book in our Bibles, is so that we can learn from Him and from it. Not about who Daniel is so much, but more so how you are and who you are. And you are good, Lord. And we're tasting of You, and we're seeing that You are good. How good You were to them then, and how good You are to us now. Lord, we want to be among those of whom it is said, they honor God, and they are honored by God. Thank You, God. Thank You for this take it from here by the Holy Spirit. We don't want to just leave this here. We want to take it with us tonight 
as we make our way home. Lord, we want to honor you. In Jesus' name, amen.